Okay, muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for your patience and um, please forgive the delay. I'd like to welcome everyone to this virtual cemetery, seminary that's called the Vida in, in the Triangle of Death, Bear Golds and its Irrational Actions in the Dominican Republic. It's a long title, but as the name shows, this is the theme that we'll be talking about today. My name is Diana Martin. I'm one of the coordinators from the NGO Mining Watch Canada that's been working for 25 years with communities impacted by Canadian mining companies. I have the pleasure of moderating this event today with Edwin Cuevas. I'll turn it over to him so that he can introduce himself. Thank you, Diana. Good afternoon to everyone, to all of our panelists and everyone who's accompanying us today in this effort today, this afternoon. We hope that our panelists fill us up with information so that we're able to make wise decisions. So let's continue, Diana. Thank you, Eudon. This webinar will have simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish, depending on the language that the panels are presenting in. On the bottom part of your screen, there's a button that says interpretation, where you can click on English or Spanish, depending on the language that you'd like. We're dividing this seminar into two parts. In the first part, we'll have uh, presentations by our six panelists, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So we'd like to invite everyone to put their questions into the chat. I'd like to start this webinar by recognizing the indigenous peoples and other ethnic groups where we are on the lands that they once occupied. I'm originally from, I live in Ottawa, which is the original territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And right now I'm in Colombia in my um, native country. And you can see that we have um, panelists from different countries, from different um, backgrounds. And I'd like to invite everyone to take a moment to recognize the importance of the lands that you find yourself on today. To give a little bit of context, I'd like to start with a quick chrono chronology of the activities in mining activities in the Republic, Dominican Republic. And I'd like to share a video so that you can hear testimonies from the communities who are being impacted by mining operations. Mining in the province of Sanchez Ramirez is located in a very important area for hydrological reasons. Mining there began during the 70s with a contract between Rosario Resources and the Dominican government. But because of financial reasons, the company suspended operations in 1999. And then the government put the mining operations out to the bid, in which was won by Placer Dome. In 2006, Placer Dome was taken over by Barrick Gold. And that's when the joint venture began between Barrick Gold and Newmont Mining. In the beginning of construction of the Pueblo Viejo Mine and the El Yagal Hailings Dam started in 2010, and then operations started in 2012. The communities that live downstream from the, the mine have expressed their concerns about the big impacts the mine has on the environment and their health living so close to the mine. Unfortunately, instead of resolving these problems, Barrick uh, announced they would expand the mine in 2019. They would be tripling this, the surface area of the mine and building a second tailings dam, which is known as the El Naranjo Tailings Facility, will create another huge waste deposit. In 2023, Barrick received an, uh, an environmental license for this tailings dam. And it was only after international and local pressure that that document was made public. And Barrick hasn't stopped there. They are expanding their presence in the country. They've now signed an agreement with 
the mining company Unigolds and are exploring exploration on the border of the Dominican Republic with Haiti. This would be 20,000 hectares of lands and it's divided between the two countries. Environmental activists and human rights activists have, have raised the alarm about the impacts that this mining operation could have. So it's important because as different uh, people around the world are raising the alarm about the need to protect water impact, water resources, to protect um, access to food, these mining projects are being proposed in watersheds that are of vital importance for the country. I'd like to next share a video so that you can hear directly from the impacted communities in the area. Thank you. Vladimir, tell us what's happening with a mining company and the negotiations. Good morning. Today we've been creating a human protest chain together with the communities who are demanding our rights as we're going to be resettled. These different communities that we belong to are in a process of resettlement. We gave a brochure to the mining company and the government of the Dominican Republic in the Ministry of Mines office, where we outlined various points that we are demanding for our resettlement, which is based on a resettlement resettlement manual. Could you explain us what your demands are to us? What your demands are? We would like land for construction of our houses that is equal to the land that we have where we are coming from. We'd like support for food while we're being resettled for at least three to five years because we aren't able to grow our own. That's part of the resettlement manual. We would also like land for subsistence agriculture, which, the, which should be for each family and other social products, projects like schools, a, a information center where the youth and the families that are being relocated can go to learn. We're, we're demanding these things to be able to protect the families that are being forced into this new location. And we need the authorities to take these into account. This is what we've been demanding as our communities, and we're going to keep doing these protests until the, the, the guidelines that are outlined in the relocation manual have been respected. We'll keep this, we'll keep this protest going today, tomorrow, and we'll continue struggling until there's a fair dialogue that's based on the best practices in the relocation manuals. Thank you. So as you've been able to hear, the people from the community here, communities here in the area of El Rayo, in the municipality of Zambrana, are here today blocking almost all the entrances where they're not letting the mining company Barri Pueblo Viejo come into the communities. And so from El Rayo in the municipality of Zambrana, this is Ramon Ventura. So now we have the opportunity to introduce our panelists. So first, we would like to hear from Leoncia Ramos. She's a member, she's from the community of La Cerca in the Dominican Republic, and she lives next to the sixth largest gold mine in the world, which is the Pueblo Viejo mine operated by Barrick Gold and Newmont. 
when her community began to feel the environmental impacts and social impacts and health impacts of the mining operations. She worked to help organize six communities located, located downstream from the mine as part of the new rebirth committee, the Comité Nuevo Renacer. The committee represents hundreds of fam families in the area that are demanding to be relocated away from the impacts of the mine. She's going to speak this afternoon about the impacts of the mine on the communities. Go ahead, Leoncia Ramos. You need to uh, unmute yourself, Leoncia. Seems like maybe she has frozen. Because we're able to see that her image seems to be frozen. Maybe we'll give her a couple of seconds. If she can't connect in this exact moment, we're going to ask her. Leoncia, can you hear me? Yes, I'm listening. Please go ahead, Leoncia. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Good afternoon. My name is Leoncia Ramos. And I'm here from next to the Barrick Gold Pueblo Viejo mine. And what we're living through here next to the mine, and I'd like to share about the exploitation activities. Since Barrick Gold has come to this, to this area, we've had extreme consequences. For example, the construction of the El Yagal tailings dam. has impacted those of us that are leaving, living downstream. I'm sorry, the interpreter's having a really hard time hearing. So once they began building the El Yagal tailing dam, they built it on top of two main rivers, the El Yagal River and the Maguaca River. It's The, and so now the El Yagal River is, comes out from below the tailing dam. There were also 26 streams that came out of the mountains where the tailing dam was, bet, was built, and those have all disappeared. At this time, there's only one stream that's left. This is called the Arroyo Toro stream. It comes out next to the tailing dam and it has been contaminated. It now, it now has all of these toxins. So since this, these, the tailing system has been built, we've had um, many problems with our livestock. Lots of animals have died. And we think that this is because of the El Yagal tailing system's impact on um, the river Maguaca. We don't have water. We've been receiving two or three bottles of water for over 10 years for drinking. Right now we're in a very difficult situation where we don't have water. We've had to actually buy our own drinking water. Our agriculture and has basically disappeared. We can't practice agriculture anymore. We've been very impacted by the contamination. Before, we used to bring our products to the market to be sold. And now we have to go many, many kilometers to be able to buy our own food when we used to be the vendors in the market. And so instead of getting better, things are getting worse. The water that falls on our communities is acid rain. We rain. We're not able to grow things anymore. We don't have chickens. We don't have turkeys. We're not able to raise animals. We don't have fruit. We used to eat a lot of mangoes. 
and now we don't have anything in our communities. And so, for example, we have a lot of health problems. There's vision problems. There's respiratory problems, illness in the lungs. In, there's kidney disease. Our children, our young girls, starting at three years old, have had um, diseases and the vaginal diseases. And we have so many different types of problems from this water contamination. Our, so, our health care, our health is in, in chaos. People in the communities have been dying. So people will go to work and then they never come home because they pass away while they're working. So we, at this moment, are living a situation that's becoming more and more difficult. And the noise is terrible. We're not able to sleep. 24 hours a day, the, all the machinery is working and, and operating, and we can't, we can't concentrate. It's, it's a terrible noise that the mind makes. These are situations that we live through. Some people think maybe they aren't. They couldn't be true, but this is very true. This is how we're living in our communities. Every day there's dust that falls all over the place, all over our house, and we have to clean it up. But we don't have access to much clean water, so we can't even clean our houses properly. The water that we're given every week is just enough to be able to eat, to, to cook, and to drink. That's why we've been complaining. That's why we've been calling for a relocation. And that's why we've organized. But we've been left below this tailings dam, El Yagal, a tailings dam that that's useful life has almost expired. then the it has grown much taller than anticipated three times taller higher than anticipated and that is a risk to the communities and we are we're afraid that we can we might disappear at any moment and why because we're afraid that if this dam collapses it would impact hundreds of families that live around the tailing dam but also it will contaminate the Maguaca River and might reach all the way to the, the Yuna Bay. So this, this tailing dam is, uh, is impacting different communities and different people. And that's why we've been, we've been raising our voices. And this is what it's like to live in the Triangle of Death. It's, there's no way that we continue living in this situation. We're just left facing, confronting death because every day we just see more problems, more insurmountable problems, which is as a result of this tailing dam that has been built. Last week, they made a a channel on the on the tailing dam so that people. So as to release some of the water that's in it, because this tailing dam isn't able to withstand much more. And this is the problem that we're facing living next to the mine that was Barrett Gold, that's Barrett Gold's mine. People say, so we have been affected and we think that it's important that the people of the Dominican Republic and beyond understand what is happening to us. This isn't a problem that started that is the result of Rosario Gold's mining operations. This is a problem that came with Barrick. And this is a problem that we are, these are the problems that we are living as a result of the El Yagal tailing exam from Barrick. And this is what it's like to live next to the tailing exam and be impacted by the tailing exam.
No se escucha, Ebra. Gracias, gracias, Leoncia. La thank denuncia. you, thank you very much, Leoncia. This issues, the issues that Leoncia is raising are very significant, and we need our authorities to take urgent action. This triangle of death has been well earned. The name, the triangle of death, has been well earned because of the, the impacts that Leoncia showed. So two things to highlight. Leoncia said that after barracks mining operations, children, girls, little girls, including little girls as three, as, as young as three years old, have been having venereal health problems. But also Leoncia showed, talked about how 20, how many streams and rivers around the tailings dam have dried up and how the river has been covered over by the tailing dam, has been buried by the tailing dam. The communities next to the dam live every week receiving two or three bottles of gallons of water that they have to use to drink for drinking water. And if they want to go to get food, they have to drive nine kilometers where they used to be able to grow their own food have their own chickens and have their own livestock. Now, today, all of this has disappeared. And the worst thing that Leoncia shared is that how they, as communities, could disappear because they're living below this tailings, Eliagal tailings dam. And if there's any sort of catastrophic event, they could disappear. This is a very important complaint that we need to pay attention to. Now we have the honor of introducing Claire. She's a professor, an adjunct professor of social justice and peace at King's University College. She's her investigations center on the intersections between health, gender, and ecology. And she uses an eco-feminist decolonial focus to analyze the impacts of mining in, American, in Latin America and the Caribbean. She spent over a year working with communities in the Dominican Republic who have been impacted by Canadian mining companies. And she's led many different um, learning courses so that her students are able to go and see firsthand the reality of mineral extraction. She's going to speak with us today about the strength about about greed, colonialist greed, Canadian foreign policy, new colonialism, and the impacts of mining on women. And a number of other of issues that she's going to speak with us today about. In the DR, we call her very affectionately Clara. Oh, Clarita. <laughs> Pero bien. Hola. Um, Pueden ver mi screen? Hello. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see her. Perfecto. Gracias. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es uh, Good afternoon, Claire everyone. King. My name is Claire Hola, King. Gente en la Dominicana. Como me dice, or, Clara. or as they call uh, me in the DR, Clara. Soy una profesora de Justicia Sociales y Paz en una universidad I'm en a Canada. professor of Social Justice and Peace. Y um, mi español es horrible, entonces My voy, Spanish voy is a terrible, cambiar a inglés. So I'm este going to switch to speak to English. Gracias. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be sitting on this panel today uh, with such brilliant community activists and researchers to discuss the real ecological and human rights violations that are occurring at the Pueblo Viejo gold mine. 
Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing and, and working with folks in, in this community for over a decade now, both on an activist and an academic level. So I recently completed my PhD uh, research titled, We Are the Living Dead, The Gendered Impacts of Open Pit Mining in the Dominican Republic. And for this, I, I had the opportunity to listen to the narratives of women neighboring the Pueblo Viejo mining site, learning about the ways in which women are disproportionately impacted by mining. So through this, seven main themes emerged, and we were so lucky to just hear from Leoncia um, and have other community members joining us on the panel today who can personally share their stories. So I'm just going to briefly go over the dominant narratives of each themes and then focus a little bit more specifically on the systemic forces of, of power. So the first theme that emerged was ecological destruction, where women shared concerns about ecological health and the impacts that this has on their livelihoods, specifically as, as mothers. They also talked about physical health and well-being and concerns about gender specific impacts, like Leoncia mentioned a little bit, uh, including vaginal health, reproductive health, um, not just for, for adults, but also for uh, young girls in the area as well. Um, which they attribute to the, the contamination of the water and land. Um, they share that they're also more exposed to this due to gendered divisions of labor, um, working with, with the, the land and the water um, more, more significantly. There were also discussions about bright lights and noise from the mining site that, that happened 24 hours a day and how this impacts their ability to sleep and therefore their, their role as mothers. Uh, the conversations of emotional health and well-being were also significant with feelings of despair and hopelessness, indignity, uh, fear and anxiety, again, specifically through their roles as, as mothers worrying about their children and worrying about future generations. There were several aspects of sociocultural erosion that the mining site has created for women that that, that women shared. Um, that they feel really impact their lives, including gender divisions of labor from things like constantly having to clean the dust from the mining site, uh, finding clean water to utilize, or caring for sick family members. Economic precarity and employment was also a concern, uh, which coincided with their loss of traditional subsistence livelihoods, which impacted women specifically as the primary agricultural workers. This was connected with narratives of deteriorating land-based identities where women shared that lands and rivers that they've used for generations are no longer safe, highlighting how this has also eliminated spaces for women to, to gather together. Narratives of sociocultural erosion also include community and familial division with typically intergenerational residing families being separated due to pollution, um, or also for, uh, conflict and division between those employed by the mining site and those resisting it, which is this typical divide and conquer tactic that we see mining corporations uh, use on the daily. Deception and corruption included discussion of bribery, of lies and corruption within the company and within the government, um, which leads to the systemic forces of power. And I'd like to share with you some of the powerful narratives that, that women um, discussed surrounding this topic. So the theme of systemic forces of power is particularly important when looking at Canadian mining corporations such as Barrick Gold, because it allows us to see the ways in which these ecological and human rights atrocities are permitted and justified through larger economic systems that serve to benefit Canadian mm -hmm. governments and corporations while exploiting and, and harming communities within Latin America and the Caribbean. So the first theme that uh, really emerged here was capitalist greed, with women recognizing um, uh, corporate greed that was fueled by a capitalist economic system, sharing things like, what Barrick does is destroy everything close to them, along with human life. It is unfortunate that they are not interested in. What they are interested in is their money and their wealth. That's all that matters in this economy. More and more money every day, even if it means that us poor people die. Women also shared their understandings of themselves as part of nature in contrast to a capitalist ideology of, of nature for exploitation and profit, saying things like, what these corporations don't understand is that our government cannot sell the river. The river is not ours. It is part of us, but it is not ours. If I take water from the river and sell it, I am stealing. If I pollute the river, I am killing. It is that simple. 
The connections made to exploitation, capitalism, and, and greed really illustrate a neoliberal development model. And mining corporations often insist that this is progress and this is development for communities, but women really resisted this, um, saying things like, what is this development they speak of? Since this development came, all the cattle have died. Since this development came, we don't have any water. Is this development? They also said the illnesses, the poison, that is the development they've given us. What is a few pesos when we can no longer even produce on the land, the land which we lived off of? One woman pointed to uh, the irony of these realities, explaining this is the province where they extract the gold. This is where millions of dollars are made. But where all this money is made, there is no electricity. There is not water. There is no clean air to breathe. So someone please tell me where is this development? Women linked these neoliberal development ideologies of progress to histories of colonialism within the Dominican Republic, sharing statements such as, Barrick is doing to us what Columbus did to our ancestors, killing us for gold. Um, several participants also discussed a narrative that uh, they shared has been perpetuated by the corporation that without proper documentation of property, they're considered to be invaders on their land with one woman saying, they've called us invaders, but we are not invaders. I want that to be made very clear because we, all of the families that are living here, our ancestors left us what they had. Our families have been on this land for hundreds of years. Barrack are the invaders. So these discussions surrounding systemic forces of power are really fueled through policies and, and regulations that allow our Canadian corporations to operate throughout the, the global south with very uh, little accountability. While Canada is home to only 0.48 of the population, Canada hosts over 80% of all mining corporations that operate abroad, 60% of which are headquartered in Toronto. And between 1990 and 2015, imperialist countries, mainly Canada, appropriated $242 trillion from developing countries through mining. Uh, and again, this is all because Canada has essentially zero standards or regulations to hold our corporations accountable. So for myself as a, as a Canadian citizen, um, I, I believe it's our responsibility to hold our corporations accountable for what they are doing abroad in, in the Dominican Republic. Now we see corporations like Barrett Gold bragging that they bring development and they bring progress to these communities. And I just wanna quickly share an example of what community-led development can actually look like. Uh, those of you who are in the, the Dominican Republic are probably familiar with La Federación de Campesinos Así el Progreso. Um, and these are photos from this community of Rio Blanco located in the mountains of Banal. And at one time, this mountain range was at risk of being exploited by a Canadian mining corporation in, in the 90s. Uh, since they successfully uh, resisted this corporation, they have since built a sustainable cooperative, which is a hub for campesino communities. They have a beautiful eco lodge, they have a coffee cooperative, they have a bamboo furniture warehouse, um, they provide community engagement programs, uh, and they receive groups from all over the world to learn about the incredible work that, that they're doing. And this is a really important example, which demonstrate the, the potential that campesino communities have to create successful, uh, sustainable and flourishing economies when this development through mining isn't forced on them. So as we heard from Leoncia already, and we'll continue to hear the resistance at Pueblo Viejo in the Dominican Republic through, through local mobilization and global solidarity is, is very strong. And I just want to end with a powerful quote from one woman in the community who said, Barrick wants us to greet them with bread, but we greet them with gasoline and fire because we are willing to die to protect our land and, commu and communities. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Clara. Te voy a llamar Clara, bla, Claire. Thank you bueno, very gracias. much, Claire. Thank you, Claire. It's very important to take into account that Dr. Claire's presentation is about the research that she's published in a book. These are lived experiences of the women in the communities. And something very important that these women have said that Claire 
interviewed is that these women said we are dead alive. And why would they say that? It's because after the mining company came, they said, how is it possible that they promote this as, develop as development when we don't have water? When they say we have development, we don't have health care. And after we've, we've had this development, we don't have agriculture. We just have uncertainty and anxiety, sadness. So that's why this research, which people are already asking for, <laughs> Claire, in the chat, and we have to share it because people want information to be able to empower themselves of their for their rights. These women said to Dr. Claire, Barrick is doing to us what Christopher Colon did when he came here. They're giving us little mirrors in exchange for gold, and they're exterminating us for gold. But something that's very important so that you're able to see the riches of these communities is that in this research, more than $242 trillion have been extracted from our people by corporations. And there's a strategic alliance between the governments and the companies, in a, a, which is a very corrupt alliance to be able to extract these resources from the people and to take it away, take them away. Thank you so much for this information, this valuable information. And so now, we have the honor of presenting Stephen Emmerman, who's basically a from the Dominican Republic now. He's a friend of, he's a twin of Fernando. Dr. Emmerman has degrees in mathematics from Ohio University a geophysical degree from Princeton, a, a PhD in geophysics from Cornell, and Dr. Emmerman has 31 years of experience studying hydrology and geophysics, including teaching these topics as a Fulbright scholar in Nepal and Ecuador. And he's published 69 pub publications that have been peer reviewed in this air in these areas. Dr. Emmerman is the owner of Malik Consulting, which specializes in analyzing the environmental impacts of mining by he does this for governments, governmental organization, NGOs, and mining companies. He's evaluated mining companies proposed and existing mining mining projects in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and all the continents. And he's testified about mining before the Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples in the United States Congress. Dr. Emmerman is the author of the chapter of waste elimination in the next version of the SME Mining and Metallurgy Handbook and one of the contributors to Safety First guidelines for mine tailings management. So Dr. Emmerman is going to talk to us today about The review he has done of the environmental impact study of the new tailings dam of Bear Gold. Thank you, Dr. Stephen, and we will adopt you as a Dominican. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, we are compared here. 
Vipantaya. I'm just sharing my screen. Is that okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to start with a review of some important terms in mining. First, waste rock. Rock, waste rock is the rock that has to be removed to get to the ore body. It's usually deposited in a dump called a waste rock dump. And then there's tailings, sometimes called colas in the DR, which are particulates of ground rock which are left over after the value, the main mineral of value is removed. They're usually um, humid and fine grained and they're retained behind a dam. So what can go wrong? The biggest thing, the most important thing is the possible the possibility of a catastrophic tailing sand failure. Here are three recent examples. On the left, the Mount Pali mine in Canada in the middle, the San Marco mine in Brazil, and the right, the Correjo de Feijao mine in Brumadinho, Brazil, where there were uh, 270 deaths. It's very important to note that tailings dams are forever. When water dams are no longer necessary, they're usually taken down but they can't just be abandoned until they collapse. But tailing stems are different. Tailing stems are never dismantled. And a question, are they maintained forever? So because they're not, all future generations have to worry about an eventual failure of a tailing stem. There's an alternative to tailing stems which is backfill in an open mine pit. Backfill in mine pits avoids the threat, the permanent threat of a, of a tailing dam collapse. Barrick Gold has been a leader in the mining industry for mine pit backfill with two projects that they finalized, three projects that are still in operation and three more planned projects. The bullfrog mine, bullfrog mine in Nevada in the United States received a, a award for excellence in mine recuperation, mine uh, closure. A little bit of a review of the Pueblo Viejo mine operated by Barrett Gold. So currently the tailings are being stored at the El Yagal tailings dam. The consequences of a failure of this tailings dam have been qualified as extreme, which means that more than 100 people could die if the dam were to fail. And now there's a proposal for a new tailings facility, tailing storage facility, which will be called El Naranjo. The new and new tailings facility would complement the existing tailings facility at El Yagal, which should reach its the end of its useful life at 2027. But the mine would like to would, will continue in production until 2049. A little bit about the design here of the new tailings facility, El Naranjo. The proposed the proposal would store tailings as well as waste rock behind a rock dam, which would reach a height of 157 meters and would have a crest longitude of 3,800 meters, which would be one of the largest uh, rock dams of this size ever built. This is a, a quote from the environmental effect assessment that's very important. So the waste rock, which has potentially acid generating materials will be stored in a permanent submerged state to mitigate the production of acid mine drainage. 
and the phreatic level should be maintained so that it um, can avoid acid right drainage forever. So this is an analysis of multiple ac of counts. So the choice to site where to site the El Naranjo tailing sand analyzed eight alternatives through a multiple account analysis that looked at economic and other technical um, considerations. In the environmental impact assessment for El Naranjo, which was finalized and turned over to the government in 2022, and then the government published this EIS on June 25th of 2023. It had eight cap chapters, six annexes, a number of appendices, and, and almost 9,000 pages. I did a revision that was 75 pages long of this environmental impact assessment with the objective of answering six questions. The EIS, is the EIS complete with sufficient information to have a complete evaluation by the part of the Dominican government and the public? Did it consider adequately the alternative of backfilling into open pit, the open pit? Was there an alternatives analysis in the EIS that chose the most, the safest alternative? Has the design been adequately tested for this proposed installation? Did it include an adequate analysis of the consequences of failure of the tailing sand? And six, finally, did it include an adequate plan to maintain the installation for large on the long term for the long term after the mine closed, mine closure? And so now I'll answer these six questions first. The impact investment, uh, the impact environmental impact study is not complete. Many of the specifications can only be found in documents that haven't been written yet, which means that these specifications aren't available anywhere. Some of the most important sections of all of the sections included in the EIS are the, the sections that look at the impacts of a, p a potential tailing stamp failure. And this section was only written in English without a translation into Spanish. The EIS only gives the, the sum of the numerical values for the alternatives that were considered for the proposal without showing how those numbers, numbers were decided. But with and without the appendixes, appendices that were missing, it's impossible for the government of the Dominican Republic and the Dominican public evaluate the risks appropriately. My second question was: Has there has there been serious consideration of backfilling of the open pit? According to my calculations, it would be possible to backfill all of the waste rock and part of the tailings into the open pit and the rest of the tailings could fill in the um, limestone quarries. But in even all of these, if these were refilled, it would greatly reduce and maximize um, the use and the, it would minimize the impacts on the of above ground storage of tailings. The cost of backfilling, I analyzed the cost of backfill, backfilling, which costs about 1.2 US dollars per ton. So therefore the cost would be 344.7 million tons of tailings and 452.7 million tons of waste rock would be 957 million US dollars. 
it's possible to compare the cost of the tailing storage facility El Naranjo as it's being proposed. The cost of the two different stages would be 2,695 million US dollars or about 3.38 dollars per ton of mine waste. This project, this projected cost is even underestimated because it doesn't include operating costs, uh, costs or monitoring or inspections or ma maintenance and revisions over the long term. So in summary, the cost of backfill would be 35% less than the cost of the current proposal for this tailing dam. The projected cost of the Naranjo tailing dam is extreme, is unusually high because usually the typical cost of storing conventional tailings is $1.2 per ton, US dollars per ton. Three, the third question, is the alternatives, the, the alternatives analysis does not focus on security, on safety, excuse me, safety. There are four risks for human life that were analyzed and they made up only 7.5% of the total scoring during this analysis. The design of this new dam has not been tested. The EIS says that it has been tested because it's been used in the El Yagal tailing dam. But where are these? Where is the proof that shows that El Yagal has been successful? In this quote, we can see that we'll only be able to see those after the El Yagal tailing dam is closed but we don't know its possible future in, in success. So where are these in, annual inspections of safety of the El Yagal Dam or the, revision, the reviews of the security of the dam or the independent tailings review board reviews or engineer of records reviews into the safety, if those even exist. Also, the consequence of file of of a uh, failure of a tailing dam have been underestimated. A tailing dam failure in the new dams would get to the Bahia, the Samana Bay, in less than five hours. An analysis of the of the consequences of the failure in the EIS doesn't take into account the real impact downstream. So the most probable scenario, looking at statistically statistical modeling, is that in a failure, 70 million cubic meters of tailings would be um, released, which would flow 227 kilometers. But the distance to the Samana Bay is only 101 kilometers. The minimal velocity would be 20 kilometers an hour for ta a tailings flow. There's no long-term plan of manage to manage the the tailings facility. The proposal for permanent water cover is an important problem. So to just review my conclusions, the EIS is not complete and it's not an appropriate document for the, and is it an appropriate document for the government to review? No, the EIS is not complete. Many important, um, much, impo much important data are not in the documents and many sections are available only in English. The analysis of different, um, the, the, the scoring for the different analysis of where to cite the dam is not complete. So the second question was, did the EIS consider backfilling open pits adequately? No. The alternative of back open pit backfill in the open pit and the um, limestone quarries have not been considered, even though Barrick has won an award for open pit backfill. All of the tailings and waste rock that are designated 
or that will be can or uh, that will result could be backfilled into open pits at 35 percent of the cost of construction of a new tailings dam above ground which doesn't even take into account the cost of operation and maintenance and long the long term three did the alternatives analysis and the EIS choose lead to the choice of the most safe alternative? There aren't there aren't indications that the analysis done resulted in the safest option. The four subcategories related to risks to human life in that analysis only made up 7.5% of the total score. Four has the design been adequately tested? No. The proposed installation of this tailings facility has not been adequately tested, and there's no evidence that Eliagal is successful. It, does the EIS include an adequate analysis of the potential failure of a tailings stand? No. It does not include an adequate analysis of the consequence of failure of the dam. Based on past tailings dam failures, the tailings flood would reach the Samana Bay in less than five hours. And finally, does the EIS include an adequate plan to maintain the installation El Naranjo on the long term after the mine is closed? No, it does not include any plan for inspection, monitoring, maintenance, or review of over the long term of the, of the tailings dam. Thank you for your attention. Muchísimas gracias, doctor. Thank Emerson. you, Dr. Emmerman. This is very impactful. Dr. Emmerman has had experience on working on all five continents, and he has a global perspective, even have mentioned tailing exams like those in Brazil that have failed, where there was a, a large number of people who were killed, 270 people. But then the issue that we're talking about is a independent review of the environmental impact study of the Bear Gold proposal. And I'd like to say that this evaluation where he looked at six different questions, Dr. Emmerman did, and where he lays out in detail the answer to each one. But it's, but surprise, the Ministry of Environment here in the Dominican Republic didn't ask any questions. And they couldn't answer any of these questions that Steve asked. But something that Dr. Dr. Emmerman said, that they're overvaluing what they would have to spend on costs for this tailing van. We as Dominicans should be very surprised by something that Dr. Stephen has said, which is if there's a problem with the new tailings dam and a failure could reach the Samana Bay in five hours. But what's more, there would be 70 million tons of tailings of toxic waste that would be released into the Samana Bay, which is a, a very important bay, which is very beautiful and a, um, a place of for tourism. And they would flow 20 miles an hour. We in the Dominican Republic, even though it's very small, if we imagine that this tailings dam fails and it could flow 227 kilometers, 
we're talking about the Bahuruko province, the Samana province, would be covered. It'd be a big part of the country. Obviously, it would depend on where they float. This, this information that he has shared as a scientist, Steve Emmerman, is, is important for the authorities to pay attention to. And so now we're going to give the words, turn over the moderation to Diana Martin so she continues introducing by introducing our next panelists. Thank you, Stephen Emmerman, for showing the Dominican public what you have so that we're able to take dis make decisions. Thank you, Eureng. I would like to, I have the pleasure to introduce Marixa Ruiz. She's an economist at the University of Santo Domingo. And she has a master's degree from the College of de Grenoble in France. She's worked with the, in planning in the Ministry of Economy in the Dominican government, as well as at the Central Bank. Currently, she's a researcher at the Observatory for Public Policies in the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo. And today, she's going to share some of the irregularities and lack of transparency around the project that Barrick operates in Pueblo Viejo. Marixa, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to share with all of you who are part of this seminar, some of the data that I think is very important over the contribution that Beric makes to the Dominican government, which are based on general norms, which we measure as economists. So exportation, what are the internal transfers of of purchases? What's the situation of of employment and wages? But the first thing I'd like to say is, in our country, we're very much lacking information. This information needs to be is essential for us to understand mining operations. We have different examples of this. The first large company that exploited mining, blocked up mining for almost 20 years in the in the Dominican Republic is the Alcoa Mining Company. You can find information about it in the National Archives. archives. And then 1958 Falcon Bridge or Falcon Mining left the country leaving hundreds of people unemployed and left the the head of this uh, this um company left fled from the airport and left 2000 employees behind unemployed who have been demanding their rights and that they receive assistance and that they And this is, there's a requirement that the government of the Dominican Republic should meet. And now the government holds shares in that company. And now we get to Barrick. So before Placer Dome was operating this mine and then it was transferred over to Barrick. And now they've been operating for 10 years exactly 10 years, but when you look at the statistics, the essential statistics in terms of, for example, taxes for the Dominican government, Barrick pays four taxes in the Dominican Republic. Net, re net rent, a minimum annual tax, which was established to compensate in participation in the economy, 
if you look at these different analysis of the income that the Dominican Republic, the Republic of the Dominican Republic has received since 2013 until 2022, because we don't have information for 2023 or 2024, it's because we're just starting. There was always, there's always an estimate in the annual budget of what was expected as a fiscal contribution from Barrick. So from 2013 to 2022, $17 million in contributions from Barrick to the Dominican Republic. In pesos, this would be 138.5 thousand pesos, million pesos, excuse me. If you analyze this and if you compare it with the export ex exportation, the exports of Barrick, which aren't public information, which we don't exactly know, but also if there's other con economic contributions of inter intermediary purchasing, we don't know those. This, the important information about Barrick isn't known publicly. The, for example, benefits from employment, from salary contributions, those aren't detailed it, or aren't made available, even though there is a, a union. And this is being set, told to you by someone who's advised unions for many, many years. And I don't have actual accurate information about what the terms of the agreements, the labor agreements between the company and the the union are. So when you analyze Barrick, they say that they create 2,000 jobs. To be able to prove that, we would have to have that information, accurate information. And now we have a president of Barrick who was a very distinguished lawyer who helped Barrick when they entered this country. But besides the number of employments, what is their what is their employment contribution? How is this distributed? What's the gender distribution of the of the jobs they're creating? How much taxes are they paying for labor taxes? What's their indirect contribution to the country? And the indirect contribution is being played by the workers, not by Barrick. So uh, the government of the Dominican Republic should be obliged or should be required to, to consider these economic impacts. We already have the, we've already seen the case of Alcoa. We've already seen what happened with the Falcon Com Bridge Company. This has been a huge cost for the government of the Dominican Republic because they allowed for this exploitation for so long and now they've disappeared and we don't know anything about them. And now the government has to pay for this and the impacts. And then in 2013, Barrick began exploiting gold in Pueblo Viejo, with a, a, a tax payment that's over $2.79 uh, $2 billion, but with millions of billions of dollars that are being exported in, in, in earnings for the country. But we don't have the key essential information to be able to analyze the real situation. So what the conclusion that we come to is that the government is not handling this situation in an adequate manner or not managing our metallic and non-metallic resources adequately. We're a small island. We have huge fragility, environmental fragility. And you know that we share this island 
with a population that's in Haiti that's almost the same as in size as our population. It, we have a huge challenge ahead of ourselves. So the information that I have about the Pueblo Viejo mine very much worry me because I know I know what's waiting for us. We have the example of Alcoa and we have the example from Falcon Bridge Mining who left 2,000 employees jobless and where we had to assume this, this cost that was a commitment of the company. And what are this, what's security and the mechanisms that Barrick has shown to the government to take away this uncertainty based on the examples that we've had here in the Dominican Republic and so that this, these examples don't happen again. I'll stop here because I know you're all able to analyze the the information on employment, on gender divisions, on labor conditions. The, what are the, what are the imports of Barrick? And there's so many different things, ways that we could analyze the situation. But what we need is the information. The government isn't. The company isn't transparent with it, and the government isn't releasing it either. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisa, for your intervention. You've left us with a lot to think about in terms of the analysis between costs and benefit. It's evident that the benefits are not a lot, are not very big, but the costs are huge. And then the lack of transparency from the company and from the Dominican government is something that needs to be addressed in a significant way and quickly. Now, I have the honor of introducing Nixon. And because we're invited him today, because the problem that's happening in the Dominican Republic isn't just in the Dominican Republic, it's also impacting other countries, especially their neighboring country of Haiti. Nixon Bumba is a human rights activist in Haiti. He's... He has a degree in sociology, and he's getting a master's in history at the University of Haiti. He has coordinated and participated in many social movements, like student, campesino, and feminist um, movements, especially in Port-au-Prince. He's also worked in areas in Haiti that have been impacted by mining so that communities know what their rights are in terms of the extractive industries. He has also been working as a consultant for American Jewish World Service, and he had the great opportunity to work as an emirate uh, professor at Yale. Nixon, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Dana. And um, I am. I feel honored to be part of this conversation this afternoon, and to talk about this very important uh, subject topic, will affect both sides of the island, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And um, I feel very interested to this conversation for, you know, uh, not only being activists, but also, and as you know, Dominican Republic and Haiti. The result where we are, where we get today, it's a result of colonialism. And mining is directly associated to colonialism. And um and the other other things I want to raise is like the fact that Haiti mining is also very associated to um to disaster capitalism and neoliberalism. What I have to share this afternoon, I shared in the chat um, the link for his website where you can find information about what we we are doing in terms of existing against mining in Haiti, and uh, and you can have more information on about that. Um, 
first thing I have to waste in Haiti, we don't have any active mining on operation in the, in the country, but the process is happening. The process is, uh, the, you know, mining exploitation the, and process. And um, I was talking about disaster capitalism, you know, just to remind, you know, at the same time in 1970, when they started investi and, uh, and investigation on, on mining on Holy Island in Haiti, including Haiti and Dominican Republic. But we didn't hear about mining from my generation um, until 2012, until 2012. In 2012, as I told you, just to remind, it was two years after the African Haiti, where more than 300,000 people died. And the big response to the earthquake was open the country for business and mostly on mining and extractive economy. This is where we heard about that. Even the process was, uh, you know, activated from 2004 after the second coup d'etat against our state. But we heard about that as Haitian people uh, has, you know, even myself, I've got very active and different movement in Haiti. We didn't hear about money, you know, and this is uh, another attempt to say, it's, you know, mining process were open and was open in Haiti with, you know, zero transparency, zero information on what's happened. We just heard that from the media after a hearing from the from the Senate where the mining um um the um my, the director of the mining and energy went to the Senate and to gave to to for a hearing. We heard about that. We now now we have more than fifty two permits, different type of permits in Haiti, and mostly in the uh, the northern part of the Haiti. And those permits, uh, we have three permits of exploit exploitation, and the numbers of permits to research because you know there is different level of permits in the country, and uh, you know vast majority of permits are on are related to exploration. And um, they use this context of trauma, this context of, uh, of disaster and catastrophe and to impose the extractive economy agenda. And this is where from our involvement, our activism on mining, and we built from 2012 to 2020, have been you know, um, very, very active to about a network we, we put in place, we call um, Mining Justice Collective, which is you know a, a coalition of different organizations in Haiti. I've been part of this, this uh, coalition, but from 2012 to 2019, 2020. And this, um, this um, coalition is, our work is you know, not, uh, to prevent mining happening in our, in our country because of uh, of uh, mining will should bring us to in the middle of triangle of the debt of the debt while under just to um to 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 link what I have to say to what Marisa just said in terms of the cost and also in the benefits for Haitian and for Dominican public people we know the, you know that will affect that will affect that will affect um mostly what we need as the essential thing to live as a human being. Um, and we, we we share this island with Dominican Republic. We never heard we about what's happening in Pueblo Vero. When and we heard about that, we went to Dominican Republic to learn from from community base, base in, in grassroots people, and we can have an idea how what look like mining exploitation in our life. How mining exploitation in Dominican Republic can affect Haiti and affect you know the basic need in Haiti, and we've been trying, we've been developing with Dominican Republic um, many collaboration. That this is you know this is our duty, Haitian and Dominican Republic to work together. Even the colonization divide us, create two people, destroyed all the indigenous people on this island. But on our time and our generation. We have to develop this kind, this um, strong relationship to protect 
our island to protect our people, to protect uh, our environment. Environment, and in the middle of the you know current situation we're living in Haiti, and last year, um, some of you or most of you um, could hear about um, the conflict. It is not really a conflict, you know. It was like promoted like as a conflict between Haiti and Dominican Republic. It is not between Haitian people and Dominican people, but it was like a conflict, you know, um, manipulated by um, foreign interests in terms of mining. And I want to mention uh, this uh, per permit for exploitation that we should by the Dominican Republic on, uh, with uh, Unigol. You know, Unigol which affect water, or affect um, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And they try to manipulate this information and to put Haiti, Haiti and Dominican Republic like in, in the middle of a struggle, but it is not true because Haiti, Haiti and Dominican Republic, we have to work together to fight together against this extractive economy who will be will bring us at, at the end of the day to the um to this triangle of debt. And now we have so many interests to work together, even we have so much to learn from Dominican. Republic because they are at this point now more than almost 15 years on the by goals ex mining exploitation and public oil. And this is this is the same company since uh, by gold and uh, new mode mining, you know, well, it's it's uh, the same companies and you know new mode is like the monopolies, you know, of uh, the permit in this country. And some Canadian company has some action in, in this on this permit, but most of the permit are um, owned by human mining, human, human, human mining, which is like the same to my goal. How we can work together, we enforce our work into fights against our mining, against extractive economy, and also fight for alternative economy for our people, for our future. And this is why we we were discussing Fernando, Fernando, myself and other other Come out from Dominican Republic, we are fighting. We are discussing how we can develop a map of, you know, of natural resources and not only natural resources, also common good. We have to protect together because we share the same common good, like water, like those kids, like um, like so many things like that. And for the point I want to to try to 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 raise, it's related to um, neoliberalism and mining. In mining or extractive economy, as you can remember from 1991, there is this kind of um, bloody uh, coup d'état against our seed, and he has to be back in the country under certain condition. One of the condition is to open the country, open to uh, the country to mining um, international uh, foreign mining companies. That was part of what we call the neoliberal package, how we can, you know, liberalize whole country for foreign investment in the country. This is where everything was started in 1996, and and when the first uh, Canadian companies came into uh, do investigation on on mining in the country. It's very related. It's very related. Today we have. Um, we have so many questions. We have so many questions. We have so many questions about um about why Haiti is under this kind of sufferance we are we're living, and and Haitian people has some some um some some sort of response, and and we think some of them of us think it's related to mining, created the chaotic situation and to have as a as a frame to you know to loot what we have as natural resources with a really high cost but lowest benefit for Haitian people. I think this conversation tonight this afternoon is like you know first point to build this triangle of life, you know, you know, in front of the triangle, in front of the triangle of 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 death. Because from mining much in Canada, which about us and Haiti too. Was about to work in the Dominican Republic and Dominican Republic in Haiti, we, we, we can operate it as a triangle in front of Canada as the paradise for mining, you know, where they are protected by the Canadian government with impunity, you know, kill, destroy, and loot 
the waste is coming good from country like Haiti and Dominica over there. Thank you so much. If you have some more what's question, I can I'm here and trying to respond. Muchas gracias, Nixon, por tu intervención. Eh, ha resaltado varios puntos importantes. Thank eh, you very much, Nixon, for your intervention and the many important points that you've raised. I want to highlight two. Is this connection between trauma, catastrophe, and mining is very sad. And it's really important that you've built a strong resistance movement, and I know you've been part of that and part of that resistance process in the country. And the second point is this point of collaboration between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. You're confronting a, a very big corporation, Unigold and Barrick Golds, which will destroy natural resources. It's very important that these two countries work together. It's 4.30 and I'm going to stop making comments and I'd like to turn it over to our last panelist today, Fernando Peña. He's the coordinator of the Public Policy Observatory at the Autonomous University in Santo Domingo. He's a member of the National Space for Transparency and Extractive Industries, which is a coalition of over 120 organizations, social movements, and impacted communities that know the impacts that mining practices have on communities and the environment. Fernando, go, please go ahead. Thank you, Diana. And thank you to, to, I give thanks to life to have the opportunity to speak today and share my observations with such courageous people who have already presented today. And then to also be preceded by such a friend and companion, Nixon, who has shared so much with us between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. We're in the middle of the Caribbean and we have so much, in, we're such an important place in terms of geopolitics and economic importance for the whole world. It's not a, a coincidence that the Triangle of Death has the El Yagal tailings dam in the epicenter where these toxic tailings have been stored and that there will be a new tailings dam proposed because this is one of the oldest dams, oldest mines in the world because this gold that was mined by Placer Dome and before that Rosaria mining is one of the gold deposits, the largest gold deposits in the world which is now the Pueblo Viejo mine run by Barrick Gold. It's a deposit that hasn't been exploited or hasn't been mined just since 2000, 2003 or, or the old Rosario mining company. Which wound up becoming a nationalized company. This point of the island has been a point of gold exploitation since the Europeans arrived on the island. It's probable that people like Galeano, were, when they were talking about building this bridge of gold between America and Europe, was thinking about the Dominican Republic and the gold that's in Cotuí and the gold that's being taken from the middle of this island, our island. So ten, since, since colonization, there's been gold mining. And it reminds me that we, so since we've had this huge mine in the middle of the Dominican Republic, we've also had other mines, for example, the Comridol mine, which is very close to the Pueblo Viejo mine. But this is a, a gold mine which is being run by a Canadian company, as we've already talked about here today. And 
and we're talking about a Canadian company and a U.S. company who own who are part of this process of colonial and neo-colonial expansion on our island that we share with Haiti. And this is a shared hegemony of exploitation. It's not just one actor, but it's a combined effort between multiple actors. So these two companies share their administration responsibilities to a certain extent, but this is what they're also proposing for this new project on the border of Haiti, where they've decided that it's a strategic to exploit Haitian gold. And it's in the um, in a watershed called La Meita, which would impact both Haitian watersheds and Republic Dominican Republic watersheds. And it's already starting to have fruit, bear fruit. But in this concession, the Neita concession, we we didn't we haven't received public information about this project. But we've we've heard that this Neita concession is also part of a fiscal reserve. But the gov Dominican government, when they talk about this, it's like as if nothing has happened. So Pueblo Viejo mine was built in an area where they built, they designated a fiscal reserve. And now they're trying to create a new fiscal reserve for this new gold deposit that they're proposing a mine for. So we're two countries here sharing an ice, an island, like we've talked about here. But really, this whole island is being impacted by this triangle of death. That's why we need to be very careful and very thoughtful about what's happening. I'd like to talk about what Leoncia shared with the communities that are living downstream of the El Yagal Dam. These communities have an urgency because they should have never been left there besides the exploration, besides the mining operations. They sh there, sh there should never have been a tailings dam built 100 meters, 200 meters from communities and houses. They talk a lot about and we, we need to talk about how this is basically condemning these communities to death because they're located next to this mine. And I would like to highlight something very serious that Dr. Emmerman said, that a new tailing dam that will impact not just the area that's already been impacted, but could also impact, for example, the, the capital of Santo Domingo because even though they've, they're have they not citing this new tailing dam where they wanted to have it before in Monte Plata, and they've moved it to, and the proposal would now be in Cotuí, near the town of Three Vueltas, right next to the communities that are already being impacted by the current tailing dam of El Yagal. This is the same danger. It would present the same danger as any previous proposals to Santo Domingo because it would impact this strategic area, which is full of biodiversity and has significant water resources, especially the Yosama River, which provides water for Santo Domingo. So we're in the middle of an expansion process from Barrick in the Dominican Republic that threatens the life, not just of the community, the lives, not just of the communities that are being directly impacted, these these six communities that are next to the current tailing dam, and the six communities, I'm sorry, eight communities that will, will be relocated to build this new tailing dam. What's been said here about the danger of the serious nature of a collapse and serious nature of the collapse of a tailing dam. 
and thinking about this impacts not just on Kotui, on the whole island. It's a very serious, serious problem that needs to be taken into account by the Dominican government. And it's not just that risks are a future problem to be dealt with, that it's that we're, we are, it's practically imminent. And since 2004, or 2014, this operation's been in, in effect and there already needs to be an expansion, which will impact, in, and mining processes have been accelerated across the entire island. We have a real threat in Kotui, and we also have new threats in this area of Dajabong, which is the border with Haiti and the north. And we can't forget at the same time, in the south of the island, there's a concession for exploration for another Canadian company, which would be where the waters of the Rio Yadisul begin and which would impact the three major water retention dams in that area, the Presa of Sabaneta, Sabanallega, and others, they would all be impacted by this expansion of mining in that area. It's a, a brutal offensive of mining in the country, especially open pit mining. as well as subterranean mining, like in San Juan, and the expansion project that Barrick is proposing in Cotoí, which they propose to create huge tunnels underground, which is located in the Triangle of Death. I don't want to take too long in this intervention, but I think all of the interventions that we've heard as well as the the urgency that we heard from Leoncia, from the communities that don't have anything, that they're dying from illnesses. They, they don't have agricultural production. They don't have any way to produce the, their food. And they don't even have water to be able to carry out their daily activities. It's all tied to a global lack of transparency in terms of, and there's very limited resources that are left behind after all of these processes. And so because of this lack of transparency, the only thing that we can say is that we need more people to chime in and multiply the, the voices that are being raised to denounce this situation. And we're, we're, we're trying to combine efforts so that we can have a offensive against these mining projects in the media or in other spaces because we, we need to confront these companies that are creating fear and depression and nightmares in the communities communities that don't have any oppor any any other alternative than to be relocated to a place where they won't be impacted by mining we have a we're confronting a danger as this island so this is basically an explosive charge that is being proposed on the border of the Dominican Republic and Haiti And it's, we have the possible for not just an ecological and social disaster, but a genocide of entire communities that would be created by a tailing dam like the one at El Yagal. And the one that the new expansion that's being proposed is three times bigger than El Yagal. And it's being done without transparency, without serious studies and investigations, research, and without the clear information presented to the public. And like Steve showed, Stephen, Dr. Stephen showed that we don't have the 
specific information that we need. And so we need to make sure that we continue supporting these responsible um, denouncements that are being made against irresponsible mining to stop all of the impacts that are created, ecocide, genocide in the communities. I hope that this can be seen and heard, not just by the authorities in the Dominican Republic, but also communities around the world so that they listen to the voices of those whose voices have been silenced, like Leoncia like Leoncia Ramos and others from her committee. And so that we continue to push back against these policies like those of that have been implemented in the Dominican Republic. Thank you, Fernando, for your very com complete, very comprehensive analysis. I think we've been able to answer many of the questions in the chat. I'd like to just turn the mic over to Edwin so he can close with a few of important points. Thank you, thank you. I had a summary that I wanted to give, but I don't think it's worth doing a summary because Fernando has done a very important summary. But also, we went after each presentation and gave a, a brief summary. I'd just like to say, so therefore, I'd just like to say that based on this information that has been provided today, scientific information, verifiable information, there's something that's not, that can't be questioned. We are facing ransacking of our natural resources, the natural resources of our people. And that has left a, a series of illness, misery, and death behind. Mining exploitation, as it's been done up until today, as it's been carried out until today, with the example that we have in the here in the Dominican Republic, instead of bringing development, is and which has been shown by the study that Claire did, brings illness and death. We'd like to thank our panelists and everybody who's presented today. We also has a, has a team behind them. There's, we would like to thank Val Croft from Mining Watch, who's here with us. We'd like to thank Diana Martin from Canada. Al also as Alice Chipo, I hope I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. I'd like to thank Leoncia Ramos, who was one of our speakers, Stephen Emmerman, Claire Gaines, Marita Ruiz, Fernando Peña, and of course, Diana and myself, who's a server, who who's here to serve you as the public. We're going to share this presentation because we want everyone in the Dominican Republic and in the world and can hear from the experts about what's happening in the Dominican Republic and what Bear Gold has done and what they've caused, the harms they've caused for the people here and it, we want them to hear what Marixa talked about. What are the benefits versus the costs and the externalities? And also the way that employ workers have been treated. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.